Okay, so hello Black Hat and thank you for attending my talk. My name is Ben and I'm here to present Lamphon, real-time passive sound recovery using light emitted from a hanging bulb. And I will start by introducing myself. I'm a, comp I'm a computer scientist and a former Google employee. I'm a PhD student at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev and a researcher at Cyber at BGU. My research focus are privacy and security of IoT devices, and you can find or read more about my research at my website. Um, this is a joint work co-ordered by me, Yaron Pirotin, Professor Adi Shamir, Professor Yuval Alovich, and Dr. Boris Zadov, all of us from Ben Gurion University and Weizmann Institute of Science. And this is the agenda for today. We will start by introducing the research question. We will then discuss the necessary background required to understand Lamphon. We will discuss Lamphon's spread model, bulbs as microphones. Uh, I will show you the evaluation from the experiments that we did. Uh, we'll discuss potential improvements, takeaways, and questions and answers. Okay, so the, first, so the primary uh, question that we ask in this research is, uh, can a hanging bulb be used as a microphone? And my answer to you is that by using scientific tools to analyze the vibrations of a hanging bulb, uh, attackers can effectively recover high-quality speech and non-speech audio. Now, I, I will start with a warning. Turning a hanging light bulb into a microphone is a very challenging task, and probably some of you are asking yourself why. Uh, the reason is that light bulbs were not exactly designed to be used as microphones, so during the next 35 minutes, I will do everything that I can in order to convince you that eavesdroppers can basically overcome this challenge if they know what to look for. Okay, so let's start to discuss about the necessary background to understand Lamphon, and uh, we will start by discussing uh, sound waves. Uh, now, here are three interesting facts about uh, sound wave. Uh, first of all, sound wave is basically air traveling through space, uh, which its source can be some object that causes a vibration, for example, a person's vocal cords. And here is another interesting fact, acoustic waves that have frequencies from around 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz can be heard by uh, humans. Uh, now, this actually leads us to discuss about eavesdropping. Now, according to Wikipedia, eavesdropping is the act of secretly recovering sound from a target or a victim without his consent. And eavesdropping comes in various forms. Uh, eavesdropping can be performed digitally and physically. And in this uh, talk, we actually discuss about physical eavesdropping. Um, physical eavesdropping relies on objects that are located in physical proximity to the sound source. Um, when a sound wave hits the surface of an object, it causes the object to vibrate, and by analyzing the object's uh, response to sound, basically the vibrations, with a proper uh, sensor, sound can be recovered. Now this principle is being used by uh, microphones, which are basically devices that are used to convert sound, sound waves from uh, to electrical uh, signal uh, using three uh, primary components. The first component is a diaphragm, which is basically a thin piece of material uh, that vibrates when it is struck by sound waves. The second component is the transducer, which is used to convert the vibrations to current. And the last component is A to D, which is used to digitize the analog electric signal to audio signal. Okay, so uh, I want to discuss about eavesdropping related research and I would mention that in recent years the scientific community uh, has suggested various ways to recover sound. Um, all of these methods are basically can be categorized into one of the following categories. Uh, the first category is what I call the internal methods and the second category is what I call the external method. So let's start to discuss about internal methods. And internal methods are basically methods that rely on uh, data which obtained by a device located in proximity to a victim. Um, in recent years, it was shown by uh, scientists that motion sensors that are integrated to smartphones and speakers and vibration motors, again, all of which are integrated to smartphones, uh, data obtained from these uh, devices can be used in order to eavesdrop sound. And in addition, even data obtained from magnetic hard drive can also be used in order to eavesdrop sound. Now, 
If I will have to summarize this section of internal methods, I would say that from the eavesdropper perspective, these methods are greatest disadvantage is that they are permissionless, which means that applications that implement these methods uh, do not require any special permissions or permissions at all to obtain data from uh, these devices. Uh, however, this method greatest disadvantage is the, the fact that they require the attacker to compromise a device with the malware and this in order to obtain data and to exfiltrate the data to his possess. Now, the second category of method is what I call the external methods, which are methods that rely on data obtained by a device that is not located near a victim. And probably the most common, uh, commonly uh, known uh, uh, method or the most famous method is laser microphone, which basically relies on a laser transceiver to recover sound by directing a laser beam at an object and analyzing the object response to sound. And <clears throat> Laser microphone is a traditional method that is being used for years uh, by eavesdroppers. And from the eavesdropper perspective, these methods have uh, two great uh, advantages. The first one is that it, it is totally external and it doesn't require as a result to, play, to compromise a device with a malware. And also this method can be applied in real time. Um, however, this method's greatest disadvantage is the fact that it is active, or what I call active method. Um, the laser beam can be detected by victims or organization by using an optical, uh, a dedicated optical sensor by uh, detecting the laser beam that is being used and which imply that a laser microphone is being used to eavesdrop sound. Okay, now, um, the second method in the, uh, in the category of external methods is uh, the visual microphone. Uh, visual, the visual microphone was suggested six years ago by a group of scientists from MIT. They suggested the use of a high-frequency video camera, which enables to capture 2,000 frames per second, uh, in order to recover sound by analyzing the object's uh, response to sound. And they were managed to show how a bag of chips can be used in order to achieve this goal uh, by uh, recovering uh, speech from analyzing the vibration of a uh, bag of chips. And from the eavesdropper perspective, this method is external as, a, uh, as a, the method of uh, a laser microphone. However, it has uh, a great advantage of uh, being passive because no laser beam is involved in a, laser, uh, in a visual microphone, um, making its detection very difficult for victims or organizations. Um, this method greatest disadvantage is the fact that it cannot be applied in real time because this method requires heavy computational resources uh, in order to process a lot of frames in order to recover sound, which according to the authors, it takes a few hours to reconstruct a few seconds of sound. Now, if I will have to summarize this entire section of related work, I would say that um, each of the methods that uh, were suggested over the years basically is limited in one of the following aspects. Uh, some rely uh, on remotely controlled device, uh, which means that eavesdropper must compromise this device with the malware. Uh, some methods are active, which makes uh, it easier for uh, the victim to detect the use of uh, such methods. And some cannot be applied in real time because they require heavy computational resources, so none of these methods are perfect. Okay. So let's discuss about Lenfone's uh, threat model. And in Lenfone's uh, threat model, we actually assume that there is a hanging light bulb which exists uh, in a target room. And we also assume that the sound in the room, which can be, by the way, the result of a conversation uh, made in the room, uh, creates fluctuations on the surface of the hanging bulb. And we also assume that there's an eavesdropper, an attacker, which basically directs an electro-optical sensor at the hanging uh, bulb via a telescope. Now, electro-optical sensor is basically a sensor that converts light to voltage. And the optical signal that is sampled from the electro-optical sensor uh, is digitized via A to D and processed using a dedicated sound recovery algorithm into an acoustic uh, signal. Uh, we named it uh, SND star in this case. Now, from an eavesdropper perspective, uh, Lenfone's uh, threat model actually uh, is external 
passive and can be applied in real time, which means that it combines the advantages of laser microphone and visual microphones as well. Okay, so um, let us discuss about how light bulbs uh, basically can be used as microphones and more specifically as diaphragms. And um, basically, as I mentioned before, as sound wave, uh, sound wave is basically uh, air traveling through space and the air causes a hanging light bulb to vibrate. It causes any object to vibrate and a hanging light bulb as well. Uh, however, a bulb's vibrations are so small that they are invisible to the human eye. So we, start, we started by asking ourselves, how small are these vibrations? And in order to answer this question, we conducted an experiment. We actually attach a gyroscope to the bottom of a hanging bulb. You can see it on the picture to the right. Um, and we produce various sound waves at different volumes from nearby speakers. Again, you can see the speakers from uh, on the uh, picture to the right. And we sampled uh, the gyroscope at uh, 800 hertz using Raspberry Pi 3. Um, and these were the results that we actually uh, that were obtained. Uh, we computed the angle as the function of the frequency. And when I say the frequency, it's basically the sine wave that was played. Uh, for phi and for theta, you can see phi and theta in, uh, in the uh, scheme uh, below. And we actually created these graphs uh, for phi and for theta uh, that are presented below. Now, by analyzing the results from the graphs, we actually con we made uh, three, co three conclusions. Um, the first conclusion is that the angle of vibration is very small. It's basically uh, in milli-degrees, as, as you can see in the graphs. Uh, the second conclusion is that um, the angle of vibrations is not equal. It changes as a, fu as a function of the frequency. Again, you can see it uh, uh, on the graphs below. And unsurprisingly, the angle of vibration increases as the volume increases. Okay, now, based on the known formula of the spherical coordinate system, we actually computed the total movement of the hanging bulb, uh, taking into account phi, theta, and the distance between the ceiling and the bottom of the hanging bulb. And we actually found that sound affected the hanging uh, light bulb, causing it to vibrate at 300 microns uh, between the analyzer spectrum. So, can we detect the movement of microns by using an electro-optical sensor? And in order to answer this question, we actually conducted another experiment. We actually directed an electro-optical sensor toward a hanging uh, light bulb, as you can see in the picture to the right. And the electro-optical sensor is mounted to the telescope, uh, to the white telescope uh, on the right. And we measured the voltage that was produced by the electro-optical sensor from various distances, uh, between one meter and 9.5 uh, meters. Now, the graph presents the results that were obtained, and you can see that a different amount of voltage is produced by the electro-optical sensor when the sensor is placed two meters away from the uh, light bulb, and when the sensor is placed uh, six meters away from the light bulb, and Again, this is not surprising because a different amount of light is captured by the electro-optical sen sensor. A bigger amount of light is captured by the electro-optical sensor when it is close to the uh, light bulb. And however, we are actually interested in measuring small movements of the bulb rather than movements of the sensor. So how can the amount of light expected for displacement of 300 microns be computed? And we actually, using the results that were obtained uh, from the previous experiments, from the previous uh, experiment, we actually computed linear equations between two consecutive points on the graph. And you can see the linear equations below. And based on the linear equations, we actually computed the expected voltage resulting from displacement of 300 microns. And again, this is also presented uh, on the table below. Now, let's understand uh, what can be uh, uh, learned from this uh, table. And in order to understand, let us assume that we use a 16-bit A2D. And the 16-bit A2D provides a sensitivity of 300 uh, microvolts. You can see the calculation in here. And analyzing this fact uh, with respect to the table, 
It means that the sensitivity of uh, a 16-bit uh, A to D, which provide 300 microvolts uh, sensitivity, uh, it means that a, uh, a, a, free, uh, a sensitivity of 300 microvolts is sufficient to recover the entire spectrum that was analyzed in this case from a distance of between two and three meters, uh, because the smallest vibration of uh, 300 microns basically produces difference of 300 uh, microvolts. So it means that we can actually recover the entire spectrum from a distance of 2.5 meters, for example. However, another conclusion that we actually made by analyzing this uh, table is that uh, in order to detect a bulb's vibration from three meters away from a, a, gra from a greater distance from, a three, uh, from, for example, four meters away, uh, the sensitivity of the system either needs to be increased or the signal obtained needs to be amplified. And later on, I will discuss how each of which can be uh, actually, uh, each of these conditions can be uh, satisfied. Okay, so we understand that the bulb is actually vibrating, but we ask ourselves what exactly is vibrating. And in order to answer it, uh, we actually obtained optical measurements via the electro-optical sensor when playing sine waves from the speakers in two scenarios. And the first scenario is with a diffuser covering the LED bulb. And the second scenario is without a diffuser covering the LED bulb. And we got these results. And you can see from the graph to the right is that the SNR decreases when a diffuser covers the light bulb. And the first conclusion we made is basically that the diaphragm is the light bulb itself and not the diffuser. It means that the light bulb is the object that is vibrating. And the second conclusion we made is basically that the diffuser decreases uh, the signal to noise ratio uh, due to the fact that it is basically aimed at distributing the light uniformly. Now, uh, we ask ourselves another question, how uniform or how uniformly is uh, the diffuser able to uh, distribute, uh, the light uh, distribute the light across the light bulb? So in order to answer it, we actually conduct another experiment where we obtained optical measurements via the electro-optical sensor when no sound uh, was played near the uh, light bulb from various angles. These were the results that were obtained and as you can see, um, the diffuser doesn't distribute the light uniformly. Um, basically, the amount of light that is captured by the electro-optical sensor uh, increases when the angle between the light bulb and the electro-optical sensor increases up to a vertical point which maximizes the amount of light that is captured by the uh, electro-optical sensor. Again, all of which were done by fixing the distance between the light bulb and the sensor. We just changed the angle between them. And as a side note, I will say that if the diffuser was able to perfectly distribute the light uniformly, uh, then we were unable to detect the small light changes that are the result of uh, displacement of uh, microns, and um, this is it. Okay, so the last experiment that we actually did is uh, we tried to compare between various types of uh, bulbs, and we did experiment where we compared the signal-to-noise ratio that obtained from three types of E27 light bulbs, um, the incandescent light bulb, the LED light bulb, and the fluorescent light bulb. And we found this is were the results that uh, uh, we obtained. And we found that sound could be reconstructed from every type of hanging light bulb that was examined. However, the signal to noise ratio of incandescent and LED light bulb is much higher than the SNR of the fluorescent uh, bulbs. And this is due to the fact that fluorescent bulb uh, able to distribute the light more uniformly than the other two types of bulbs that were examined. Okay, so um, we decided to evaluate Lamphon uh, in real setup, not in, uh, in a lab setup. And in order to do so, we actually evaluated Lamphon's performance for recovering sound from a bridge located 25 meters from an office. You can see the bridge on the picture to the left. And I would say that the office also contained a 12 watt E27 LED a hanging light bulb. And let me show you the experimental setup. And afterwards you will see uh, a video that was taken um, from uh, where we actually conduct the experiment.
Okay, so as you can see from the video, um, no sound uh, that is played in the office can be heard from the bridge. Uh, there's an ambient, there's an ambient uh, sound which is the result of the uh, rail station that is located uh, below this uh, pedestrian bridge. Um, on the right corner, you can see how the uh, light bulb is captured from the telescope. This is basically what the electro-optical sensor enables to see or to capture when it is mounted to the telescope. And the first thing that we did is we tried to characterize the baseline. And we did it by conducting an experiment where we actually obtained optical measurements via the electro-optical sensor uh, when no sound was played in the uh, office. And this is the FFT graph of the optical measurements that were obtained. Um, we, we actually got to two interesting uh, uh, results and conclusions. Uh, first of all, the LED bulb work, works at uh, 100 hertz. And as a result, there are peaks on the FFT graph at each of uh, uh, the harmonics of 200 hertz, 300 hertz, etc. And the first conclusion we made from uh, this uh, uh, result is basically that we need to filter this noise uh, with bandstop filters. Also, we found that there is uh, noise at low frequencies which are below the 50 hertz. Uh, they are boxed in, uh, in red in this case. And this noise is, back, is the, the result of uh, the location that we actually uh, uh, made the uh, experiment. We uh, put our equipment on uh, a pedestrian bridge, which is located above uh, a rail station. So there, there's a lot of uh, noise that uh, vibrations that uh, actually uh, they are the result of uh, the bridge uh, vibrating. And the second conclusion that we made from this result is basically that we need to filter this noise with a high pass filter. Now, all of these conclusions are in order to isolate the audio sig signal from uh, the optical signal without adding uh, a lot of noise to the, to the audio signal. OK, now the second experiment that we did is we tried to analyze the frequency response. And we did it by obtaining optical measurements via the electro-optical sensor when a frequency scan was played via speakers in proximity to a hanging uh, bulb. And <clears throat> this, are, uh, the, uh, this is the results that we actually got. Now, we actually did it with three types of telescopes, all of which have different size of uh, lens. And the first conclusion that we made is that the signal-to-noise ratio basically improves when a telescope with a greater lens is used. I will explain later why. Uh, uh, this actually happens. And the second conclusion we made is that the signal-to-noise ratio is not equal across uh, the spectrum. Uh, so an equalizer needs to be applied in order to balance the frequency response of the recovered signal. Uh, on the right side, you can see the equalizer that we designed based on uh, the experiment that we did. OK, now the next experiment that we did is we tried to recover non-speech audio. And we did it by, uh, we played two famous songs inside the office, Let It Be by The Beatles and Clocks by uh, Cold, Coldplay. And we obtained optical measurements and we recovered the signals. And these are the results uh, visually. Opt of T is the uh, raw data that was obtained from the optical uh, measurements. SND star is basically the recovered uh, signal. And SND is the original signal. Uh, these are spectrograms of the uh, of the signals that were obtained and uh, recovered and played. And for many of you, it doesn't say a lot. So in order to convince you that this is actually uh, a high quality uh, signals, um, I will show you videos where we shazammed the recovered signals. And I will show you that Shazam was able to accurately identify each one of them. <laughs> OK, now as you can see, Shazam was able to uh, recognize each and every one of these uh, songs. Also, Soundhound was able to uh, do the same uh, thing. And 
The next experiment that we did is we actually um, decided to recover speech audio. So we played the famous statement made by Donald Trump inside the office, we will make America great again. Now we obtained the optical measurements and recovered the signals. And let me uh, show you the results. Again, OptoFT is the raw data, SND star is basically the recovered uh, signal, and SND is the original signal that was played. Uh, we decided to investigate whether the recovered signal could be transcribed by Google speech to text engine. Let me show you the results. We will make America great again. Okay, now as you can see, um, basically this is a high quality recovered signal, which uh, uh, also, as you can see from the video uh, below, um, Google, uh, Google's uh, speech-to-text engine enables to accurately identify each and every word of it. And bear in mind that uh, Lamphorn attack is capable of understanding uh, President Trump, which is a very challenging task nowadays. Okay, so let us discuss about the potential improvements. And one potential improvement that can be used in order to optimize uh, the uh, quality of the recovered signal is using a telescope with a larger lens diameter. Um, this is due to the fact that the amount of light that is captured by the telescope is a function of its lens area. And as a result, a bigger, uh, um, a bigger telescope with a bigger lens is able to capture uh, a bigger amount of light. And as a result, the signal-to-noise ratio is actually optimized uh, from uh, this uh, uh, fact. And you can see it uh, in the graph to the right. OK, another potential improvement is, uh, using, uh, is optimizing the electro-optical sensor. You can do it either by using a better or more sensitive electro-optical sensor that, than the one that we used, or either by using multiple electro-optical sensors for uh, multi-channel audio recovery. Um, which is a common approach in audio processing. OK, finally, there's, uh, you can also optimize the A2D, and you can do it by using an A2D with a lower noise level than the one that we use, or using a better A2D, a 24 or 32-bit A2D, instead of the 16-bit uh, A2D that we used in our experiments. And also, I mentioned it briefly, but we, um, we actually used only standard techniques of uh, audio processing, which involves basically Benstow filtering and high pass filtering and some ec uh, equalizer and some standard denoising techniques. Um, today, there are much more advanced filtering techniques to filter noise from the signal. Um, for example, deep learning is uh, an option. However, it comes with a cost. You will have to probably collect uh, data in order to train such a model, and this is something that probably eavesdroppers would like to uh, avoid. Um, so again, this the final optimi optimization is come with uh, with some cost. Okay, so we are uh, reaching to the end, and I uh, intend to discuss about the main takeaway that I want you to take from this talk when you discussing about. Uh, this research with your friends. And it is now uh, 2020. However, I do believe that the year of 2026 is probably going to be a meaningful year in the life cycle or in the lifetime of Lemphon. And in order to explain you why, I suggest to examine uh, Gyrophon's uh, scientific progress. Now, for many of you, the name Gyrophon doesn't say a lot. However, in 2014, uh, the attack of eavesdropping via motion sensor uh, was revealed by a group of uh, scientists from uh, Stanford University. Uh, they, they named it uh, Gyrophon. Um, basically, they showed that they can classify isolated words by obtaining data from Gyrophon that is integrated to each and every uh, mobile phone nowadays. And they show a classification model that enables to classify isolated words that yield only uh, that yields only uh, results that only slight better than a random guess. Also, the attack vector back then relied on uh, speech at uh, high volume, and as a result, if I will have to somehow place the gyrophone in the, on the scale of practicality between not practical and highly practical, I would say the gyrophone is probably uh, on 2014 is considered hyper, uh, not practical at all. 
However, between 2015 and 2018, an increased understanding regarding this attack vector was gained, and the accuracy of the classification model was improved, and a better under understanding regarding the experimental setup uh, was gained, and some other studies even suggested the use of accelerometer instead of uh, gyrophone, uh, of, instead of uh, gyroscope. And I would say that they actually uh, optimize the practicality, so it will be somewhere in the middle between not practical and highly practical. And finally, uh, on 2020, on NDSS, a group of scientists, I think they are from China, um, showed how the attack vector can be improved. So it is now, uh, I believe, makes a real threat or real and practical threat uh, to privacy. Um, they show a classification model with the excellent accuracy. Uh, also, the attack vector, uh, they show how it can be relied at uh, a normal volume of uh, speech rather than high volume of speech, which basically they made the attack very practical uh, um, nowadays. Now, my conclusion from analyzing this scientific progress is that it took six years to improve gyrophone to the point that it is now poses a real threat to privacy. And if I will have to say something regarding Lamphone now, so Lamphone is probably an evolution of visual microphone, and I believe that by making it uh, um, able to satisfy, uh, to, to, to work uh, in real time, which is something that visual microphone didn't able to provide, um, we actually optimized uh, the uh, practicality to a, pl to a place which is somewhere between, in the middle between not practical and highly practical. And I believe that during the next six years and by 2026, um, scientists will improve LAMP phones, so it will also pose a real threat to, to privacy. You will probably gonna uh, hear about another passionate PhD student that will come either to use the security or, or will uh, present his work on DEF CON or yeah, at Black Hat or maybe even on security and privacy. And he will tell you, hi guys, uh, remember the guys from Ben Gurion University that suggested Lamphone back then on 2020? I was able to now make it a real threat to privacy. I know how to convert light to uh, sound at uh, normal uh, uh, at normal volume uh, rather than uh, in high volume and this is the primary takeaway that I want you to take from this uh, uh, from this talk now I want to thank you all for attending my talk and if you will scan the QR code to the right you will be able to uh, get into the website that we made for Lamphone. Um, this is probably uh, a good time for me to take questions from the audience. Thank you once again. Okay, so I want to thank the audience uh, for attending this talk and for the beautiful words that you actually wrote uh, on the chat. Now, I want to address several questions that were raised by the audience. Uh, Imad, asked, uh, uh, Imad asked, what is the distance, the effective distance that we were able to recover sound? So basically, you saw in the uh, experiment, it was 25 meters. Um, I think it was Zach that mentioned or asked how objects in the path of the electro-optical sensor influence the SNR. So basically, they are decreasing the SNR. But as you can see, uh, we were able to uh, recover sound through a curtain wall. So uh, basically, they are decreasing the SNR, but you are still able to recover sound. Um, Gerald said, asked if uh, the ambient sound near the sensor affects uh, the recovery. So basically, the answer is no. Uh, you can see that uh, the experiment where the, uh, uh, we, we placed our uh, equipment on the bridge, and the bridge is located uh, over a rail station, uh, is very noisy and uh, it doesn't affect the recovered sound at all. Uh, Troy asked a very good question, what is the decibel level? So basically when we uh, did this experiment, it was a few months ago, maybe three months ago when we uh, recorded this experiment, um, we used very high uh, uh, volume, it means around 100 decibels, and, ever, and three months ago this is what we were able to do. Uh, during the last two weeks, we were able to improve uh, Lamphone 
to a level of 70 to 80 dBs, which is somehow a normal conversation, like uh, the one that I'm just, uh, the volume that I'm just using for this talk. And we did it, uh, I hope to uh, publish the paper uh, uh, soon, but we uh, were able to do it using a desktop uh, light bulb and just by applying some magics to the, uh, to the obtained uh, optical measurements. Um, John asked, how is the directionality influence? So it's very influenced if the speaker won't direct its sound uh, to the uh, uh, light bulb. So um, we won't be able to recover sound, but as long as there is somehow air that uh, hit the, hits the surface of the, uh, the uh, light bulb, then you basically have a good chance to, to do things. Uh, how much the telescope costs? So this is what we call uh, somehow uh, telescopes for uh, for uh, hobby. Uh, they cost several hundreds of dollars. Uh, you can buy them uh, by yourself, uh, probably in Walmart. Um, regarding speech from multiple people, uh, this is works as well. Again, it does not affect the way that uh, sound should be recovered. And I think that this is it. I want to thank you so much for coming to this talk and attending my talk. And I hope you had great time. Great time. And and you again can see some of our new uh, uh, progress in the website. That uh, uh, if you will scan the QR code. Thank you so much. <laughs>